So what I want to do here at Disciple Dojo's YouTube channel is take a specific term that you may have heard and unpack what it actually means. Just so you'll know in conversation or when you're reading or just for your own personal growth. So if you appreciate these videos and you think they're helpful, please like and subscribe to the channel and share them with other people. Because the goal of these videos, as all Disciple Dojo videos, is to equip, engage, and empower God's people. Let's talk about the term hermeneutics. Maybe I'll put a little hermeneutics. What does this word mean? So we're going to look at here the definition of hermeneutics, and this is from the Pocket Dictionary of Theological Terms by InterVarsity, and it says hermeneutics, the discipline that studies the principles and theories of how texts ought to be interpreted, particularly sacred texts such as the scriptures. Hermeneutics also concerns itself with understanding the unique roles and relationships between the author, the text, and the original or subsequent readers. Biblical hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. So a person's hermeneutic is how a person approaches the biblical text. Why use such a weird word? Why not just say interpretation? Well, it comes from, like a lot of English, a Greek root. And so the verb in Greek is this down here at the bottom, hermeneuo. And it has a couple of meanings. The first basic meaning is to help someone understand a subject or matter by making it plain. That is, to explain or interpret. The second meaning of hermeneuo is to render words in a different language, translate. And sometimes that means translating, and sometimes that means just explaining. A hermeneutes is one who helps someone understand thoughts expressed in words. Translator. And in Greek, this is sometimes said written as a compound word, diermeneia. It's just a synonym. It means explanation, interpretation, translation. And so a diermeneutes is an interpreter or a translator. And this can be used of normal speech or even of prophetic speech or ecstatic speech, which is how it's used in 1 Corinthians 14. Diermenuo, to translate from one language to another or to clarify something so as to make it understandable, to explain or interpret. And so if we look up here, Luke 24, 26, we see an example of Jesus doing this thing. This is one of many places where these terms, either with or without the dia prefix, are used, and they vary in different manuscripts, but the words are essentially the same thing. In Luke 24, verse 27, when Jesus is talking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he asked them, was it not necessary that the Christ or the Messiah suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then verse 27, and beginning from Moses and from all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And there's the word right there in Greek. So you can see, diermenusen, he interpreted. Hermeneutics just means interpretation. We all do it all the time. Some people will ask things like, well, why can't I just read something? Why do I have to interpret it? Or they're very skeptical. Some Christians come from traditions that are very skeptical about like book learning. You know, oh, you go to one of those cemeteries instead of seminary. What they're doing is playing on the fear that head knowledge can sometimes mess up or prevent heart knowledge that the spirit wants you to have. There's a kernel of truth to that. People can get so wrapped up in interpretive minutia that they miss the obvious meaning staring them in the face. That's a very real thing. But the antidote to bad hermeneutics isn't no hermeneutics. Like Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart in their book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, they say flat out on page 21, the antidote to bad interpretation is not no interpretation, but good interpretation based on common sense guidelines. And that's exactly right. Nobody can avoid interpretation. Every time we pick up a newspaper, every time we look at a meme online, every time we read an article in an encyclopedia, or watch a movie, we're engaging in hermeneutics. We know if we're watching a movie that we don't need to fact check it the way we do if we're reading a newspaper report. And so when we approach a newspaper article, we approach it with a different interpretive lens, a different hermeneutic than we do if we're reading a work of fiction. Why can't God just tell us what it means? Why do we need hermeneutics? Walt Kaiser and Moises Silva, in their book, Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics, they give a pretty good answer. Silva says, It turns out, in fact, that we need hermeneutics not precisely because the Bible is a divine book, 
but because in addition to being divine, it is a human book. Strange though that may sound, such a way of looking at our problem can put us on the right track. Human language by its very nature is largely equivocal, that is, capable of being understood in more than one way. Then he goes on to say, what we need to appreciate, however, is that the potential for misinterpretation is almost always there. And so then he goes on to ask, well, if interpretation is so important, why aren't we taught it in school? Why don't we learn interpretation when we learn how to read? And he says, the simple answer is that we have been taught hermeneutics all our lives, even from the day we were born. It may well be that the most important things we learn are those that we learn unconsciously. Every time you read the newspaper or hear a story or analyze an event, you prove yourself to be a master in the art of hermeneutics. Now, most of us do not say that we're practicing grammatico historical exegesis when we read a letter from a relative, but that's precisely what we're doing. We can't not interpret. It's impossible. So the question is, are we going to interpret correctly or incorrectly? Are we going to accurately interpret or are we going to misinterpret? Even if we can't be 100% certain that our interpretation is always the right interpretation, and we shouldn't be, there are issues where we should hold different views with loose hands, recognizing that Christians across the spectrum throughout the centuries have disagreed on how we should interpret a particular passage or groups of passages. That's okay. We don't have to have absolute certainty to be able to say we should strive as best we can to interpret correctly. And what that means is we should realize that our interpretation is not the same thing as what God intends a passage to be saying. We could be wrongly interpreting. Here's a pretty funny example. This is from Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. In their opening chapter on the need for hermeneutics, why do we even need hermeneutics interpretation to begin with? They tell this story. A woman explained to her therapist that God had told her to divorce her husband and marry another man with whom she was romantically involved. She cited Paul's command in Ephesians 4.24, King James Version, put on the new man as the key to her divine guidance. So she read her Bible and read Paul say in Ephesians 4.24, put on the new man. And she took that to be God telling her, get rid of this husband of yours and go be with this new man, which is just ridiculous, but also a little bit ingenious. (laughs) And they go on to say, as humorous as this sounds, she was absolutely serious. Although modern translations clarify that Paul was instructing believers to replace their sinful lifestyle with a Christian one, this woman, preoccupied with her marital problems, read her own meaning into the passage. And that's why we need hermeneutics. This was brought home to me in a real life example through my time in India. I've spent a number of years going to India, visiting with friends over there who are pastors and ministry leaders, and we have discussions about scripture, and I don't speak the Oriya language. So what I have to have is a what? Now, some of you probably said, oh, you need a translator. Others of you probably said, oh, you need an interpreter. See, we use those words interchangeably, much like the Greek word, hermeneuo. Yes, I needed both. I need a translator because I don't speak the actual language that the people that I'm hanging out with are speaking. I also need a skilled interpreter because sometimes the words that I say and the way that those words get translated by the translator don't capture the meaning of what I'm intending to say. One of my translators, uh, Satis or Rohini, both amazing translators, they do a fantastic job of being able to keep up while I'm talking. They can be translating with only short pauses in between, and they are just wonderful people, wonderful translators, wonderful brothers in Christ, solid biblical minds, but they have never lived in America. They've only lived in India. So, Sometimes I would say things, I would use figures of speech, or I would use illustrations or images that I don't even realize come from a pop culture source that's unique to America, or at least to the Western world, and they would be translating. And then a friend of mine who has spent years and who does live here and also has lived in India, so he is multicultural in his understanding of things, including pop culture references and figures of speech. Sometimes he would chime in and say, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. And this would all be in Oriya. I don't know what they're saying. I would just sit there and smile. They would have a conversation. My translator 
and my friend who was saying, that's not exactly what he meant. Yes, that was the word that he said, but what he meant to say, here's a better way to say that so that these other people who know nothing about American culture, that they'll understand his meaning. And it was a crucial concept. And I'm so thankful for him because what PR was doing, my friend who was fluent in both American and Indian culture, is he was able to interpret after the words had been translated. And then that helped the translator come up with a good way of saying it in such a way that their audience there, that their friends there could understand my meaning. You can translate a word literally, but misinterpret it if you're not familiar with the language, the customs, the figures of speech, the cultural background, or any other number of details about the person who's communicating. So in the case of biblical hermeneutics, the person who's communicating is God through ancient Near Eastern Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek-speaking authors. So when we read the Bible, we can't, even if we say, well, I'm just going to sit down and read the Bible and take the plain meaning. Well, unless you're going to sit down with a Hebrew or a Greek passage of Scripture, you're already relying on someone doing hermeneutics because somebody had to interpret and translate that passage in a way that they think is accurately conveying that original Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. So at no point in the process of biblical reading can you say, I don't need interpretation, I'm just going to read the text. It's impossible. You cannot do it. We all bring a lens through which we read scripture. We view scripture through a lens. The question is, is it a clear lens? Is it a lens with a few smudges? Or is it a completely dirty, distorted lens? We want to have a good lens. We want to have a good hermeneutic. And we may encounter somebody with a different hermeneutic than us. In my Bible review videos, if you watch them, I analyze different study Bibles in how they deal with different passages. And one passage that is a great example of hermeneutic is Genesis chapter 1. Some people will come to Genesis chapter 1 with a literalistic hermeneutic, which means that they are predisposed to read Genesis chapter 1 as if it's giving literal, precise, scientifically verifiable details. They just say, well, I'm just reading it plain. I'm not interpreting. I'm just taking the words in it plain meaning sense. They may believe that, but they're wrong. They're not doing that. Because somebody could come to Genesis 1 steeped in the background of ancient Near East cosmology, and they may read Genesis 1 and they may see symbols of things that aren't scientific realities, but that are cosmic or spiritual realities. And so they would say the same thing. I'm just reading the text, but I'm reading what it is, which is an ancient text, and the ancients didn't know any science. So why would I read them through the lens of a modern scientific worldview instead of reading the words as they actually were intended to be read? And throughout church history, others have read Genesis 1 with what's called an allegorical hermeneutic, where they say there's a meaning to the plain surface level reading of the text, And whatever it is, is not as important. The real meaning is its allegorical meaning. And so they would try to line up maybe the days of Genesis or the types of plants or animals that are mentioned and find allegorical meanings in those images. Now, whether that's right or wrong and whether we should read Genesis in any one of those ways has to be determined by a study of Genesis 1. Not a priori beforehand say this is how I'm going to read it and then blotting out other hermeneutics in favor of our own. No, we have to study. We have to do the work of interpretation and we have to listen to other interpretations, other hermeneutics. And then we have to weigh within ourselves and among our church body that we belong to and with our trusted Christian friends and people who we look to for wisdom and guidance. And and in community, we have to determine, okay, what do I think is the most plausible hermeneutical approach? And everybody engages in it, whether they realize they do or not. So, If you appreciate this video, again, be sure to like, subscribe, share, click the little notifications bell so you can see more. If you want to know more about hermeneutics in general, I encourage you to do our free course at Disciple Dojo. We have an entirely free course right here online, 100% free. It's called The Bible for the Rest of Us. And it is an entire course 
in hermeneutics, basically. We don't ever use the term. I don't know if we use the term or not. We may use the term, but if we do, it's just in passing. It, it is a course about interpreting the Bible. If you're interested in that, see the link in the description below. And if you're interested specifically in questions involved in reading Genesis 1 accurately and faithfully, we have an entire course here at Disciple Dojo that's absolutely free as well, just on that question. It's called The Bible and Science, Friends or Foes. It's also completely free, and it'll be available at the link in the description below. And lastly, I'm a big believer in reading, and I want to help point viewers to resources that can help you go deeper. If you're watching Disciple Dojo videos, there's a good chance that you care about interpreting the Bible correctly, or at least as best as you can. So I wanna give you some resources. If you're basic, brand new, but you're interested in any of this, the first book I wanna recommend, Gordon Fee and Doug Stort's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. This is an earlier edition. I believe it's on a fourth edition. It may be on a fifth edition by the time you see this. I don't know. One of the best books ever written on biblical interpretation for a popular level audience. Doug Stewart was one of my professors at Gordon-Conwell, one of my Old Testament. He was actually my Hebrew professor, and he and Gordon Fee are both phenomenal scholars. I highly, highly, highly recommend this as your first place to go. If you want a little more structure, there is an introductory course on hermeneutics that is actually in the form of this book. It's called Grasping God's Word, and it's by two J's, J. Scott Duvall and J. Daniel Hayes. So the two J's, Dr. J's. This is a great book. It doesn't just give you information like in reading format. It actually has exercises that you can do. There are little step-by-step -step sample passages that they walk you through. And their dominant image for understanding how to interpret the Bible, hermeneutics, is this what they call the principalizing bridge. And so basically I, you can read the chapter. I won't get into it. But the whole idea is we live here and the biblical world is over here. What we have to do is go back into the biblical world, crossing this river of culture, language, time, situation. We have to cross that river. Sometimes it's a small river. Sometimes it's a massive like Nile River river. And we have to go and walk around in the town, reading the text. And then we cross the principalizing bridge, bring the principles that we find there back into our modern setting. And there's the modern town with buildings and streets and cars. So the whole idea is every time you read the Bible, you're going back into the ancient world. And then in order to grow from it, you are bringing back the core principles, the truths that you're finding there, but in a way that can be applied into our situation where we live today. And that that's a neat image, a good way to think about what hermeneutics is at its core. That's really what it is. Check it out, Grasping God's Word, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Stuart and Fee. These are beginner level resources. For a little more advanced, those of you that want to go deeper and, and dig more into the issues surrounding hermeneutics, and there are tons of them. It's an entire field of study. The two books I mentioned earlier, I'll recommend this one. I don't have the dust jacket for anymore because I got it used, but Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Let's put it in focus right there. And it's by William Klein, Craig Blomberg, and Robert Hubbard. It's a great book. It's more of a, you know, it's not a workbook. It doesn't have diagrams or anything. And they get into things like genre, types of writing, translations, all of that stuff. So great book. Lastly, another Old Testament professor of mine, Walter Kaiser, he and Moises Silva wrote An Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics, The Search for Meaning. Kaiser and Silva alternate chapters. So one chapter will be by Kaiser, one chapter will be by Silva. And like Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard's book, they also discuss how do you interpret the different types of writing in scripture, the different genres, poetry, history, wisdom, literature, prophecy. So for readers who want something a little more advanced than these, I would recommend these. This video is going on long enough. Let's end it now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time here at Disciple Dojo.